afternoon. Um, we're here to talk about the book March. Uh, and with me are the three gentlemen responsible for it. Uh, at the end, Nate Powell, Eisner winner, Ignatz winner, Los Angeles Times Book Prize finalist. And, uh, well, if you've read March, you probably need some room on that shelf. Andrew Aiden, uh, longtime congressional aide, uh, noted published uh, scholar of comics, uh, March is his first graphic novel. And, uh, well, since we only have about 50 minutes, uh, the gentleman to my immediate right, uh, the Honorable John Lewis. Well, Congressman, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much for having us. Um, I mean, this year is the, the 50th anniversary of the March for Jobs and Freedom, which is not the march uh, discussed in the title. Um, but it's given us all the chance to talk about and hear about what went on then. Um, it's given the opportunity for people like Bayard Rustin, for example, to receive some of the acclaim and notice that he never did in life. Um, but I was wondering if you could talk about uh, one of the other organizers of the march, uh, who I know you are a great admirer of for many years and got to know, uh, A. Phil Randolph. Well, I'd be very uh, happy and pleased to speak about A. Phil Randolph. Uh, a. Phil Randolph was born in Jacksonville, Florida, um, moved to New York City, and became an organizer for labor and a champion of civil rights and human rights. He organized something called the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters to represent the men uh, working on the railroad. He uh, always dreamed of having a march on Washington. Uh, he threatened uh, President Roosevelt with a march back in uh, uh, 1941. He uh, was this unbelievable guy. I've always said that if he had been born maybe at another time, on another continent, maybe in another country, he probably would have been president, the prime minister, or something. Uh, in some of those meetings where we would meet, he would always say something like, Brethren, if you cannot say something good about someone, don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> and I, really, I got to know him very, very well. Uh, 50 years ago. The first meeting we had with President Kennedy in June of 1963, back then I was only 23 years old, had all my hair and a few pounds lighter. <laughs> in that meeting, he told President Kennedy, he said in his baritone voice, he said, Mr. President, the black monsters are restless and we're going to march on Washington. Now, 1963 was a year when there had been so much activity, so much action in the movement. The Birmingham movement, where Bull Connor had used dogs and fire hoses. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. had been arrested and taken to jail, and he wrote a letter from the Birmingham jail. Mega Edwards had been assassinated in Mississippi, and President Kennedy had invited us to the White House, and, but he didn't like the idea of a march on Washington. He said, Mr. Randolph, if you bring all these people to Washington, will there be violence and chaos and disorder? And we'll never get a civil rights bill to the Congress. Mr. Randolph spoke up again and said, Mr. President, this will be an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent protest. And President Kennedy sort of rocked in his rocking chair and turned, said, I think we're going to have problems. We left that meeting with President Kennedy. We came out on the lawn of the White House. And Mr. Randolph was our spokesperson. He was the dean of like leadership. And he said, we had a meaningful and productive meeting with the president. We told him we were going to march on Washington. <laughs> and that was it. And a few days later, we met in New York City at the old Roosevelt Hotel, the six of us, including Martin Luther King Jr., James Farmer, the core, Rob Wilkin, the NACP, and Whitney Young. And in that meeting, we invited four major white religious and labor leaders to join us in organizing and calling for the March on Washington. And the rest is history. And 
it was Mr. Randall who presided over that unbelievable program, the day of the march. And I remember when he introduced me, he said, I now present to you young John Lewis, the national chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And I spoke. And when it came time to introduce Dr. King, he said, I now present to you the moral leader of America, Martin Luther King, J.R. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. And when the march was all over, President Kennedy invited us back down to the White House, and he stood in the door of the Oval Office, greeting each one of us, saying, you did a good job, you did a good job. He was beaming like a proud father. And when he got to Dr. King, he said, and you had a dream. <laughs> that was my last time seeing President Kennedy. Because on November 22nd, he was assassinated. So the book March tell the whole story of the March. And the books to come will tell the story, not just of the sit-ins, we tell some of that in, in this book, book one, but in book two and book three, we tell the whole story of my life growing up in rural Alabama, coming through the march on Washington, the city and the Freedom Ride, the march from Selma to Montgomery. And these two young men here, Andrew and Nate, uh, they make it real. I mean, Andrew, you've, you've spent years uh, working for the congressman. Um, is part of writing this book just deciding which of these stories cannot fit into the book? Um, you know, the, the congressman tells these stories to the kids, right? And so you sort of, uh, you see the way their eyes light up, and you see how they get excited, and you see um, where they take inspiration. And so when we try and put it together, it's very much in this oral history, uh, in this oral tradition. Um, and so it's, it's, I think part of the reason it became a trilogy is because there's, there's, there's no way you can cut, right? I mean, you, you have to tell it the way it is. You, you have to, to give the, the, the good and the bad, the ins and the outs. Um, because when you're telling a history, um, everybody's contribution is important. Um, sometimes maybe what I think makes this project a little special is that we don't gloss over things. You, know, you, you try really hard to tell everything you can in the space you have. And then Nate brings that to a whole nother level with, with the way that he can depict the scenes. Because Nate, I was going to bring that up because, uh, I mean, the book obviously, uh, well, I'll use the comparison. Like Mouse, it gets a lot of attention because of the subject matter. Um, but like Mouse, it also requires art and a, a skill with the language of comics. Um, and, and talk a little about just trying to use your own uh, skill and your own uh, approach to comics in telling the story. Uh, sure. Um, I guess there were, there were a series of steps. You know, when I received the script from my cohorts, and uh, I sort of uh, immediately uh, you know, the first step was breaking it down in terms of determining what the actual pace of the book was. And uh, originally the book was a single, maybe 160 page graphic novel. Uh, and uh, it basically, within a week or so, I realized we were dealing with an epic. Um, but in, ter in terms of decision making and uh, trying to, I guess, trying to find where my responsibility was on, in the narrative chain. Uh, a lot of it had to do with first, you know, like I spend my life kind of you know, like living and breathing comics, and uh, you know, most of us in this room, but then also most people from my generation and all, even the generation prior, you know, we've grown up with enough general literacy about comics, not just as a as a medium as a form, but comics itself as a language that we're able to sort of take for granted some of the, some of the tools the, and the semiotic methods and the narrative tricks that allow comics to be not just a union of words and pictures, but its own language. This is the kind of thing that I take for granted because that's, that's the air that I breathe. And uh, 
so very quickly, you know, when I was when I was trying to determine what parts of the script or captions or descriptions I should maybe send back to the writing half to you know consider for deletion because you know we wanted to avoid being redundant as you know as comics try to do with words and images. Uh, then it made me realize that you know with the potential scope of a project like this, you're also also you're also trying to find the balance between. Uh, utilizing comics to its fullest with a comics literate uh, cross-section of people, but also making comic storytelling uh, readable, but also saturated with information, very descriptive and rich, uh, in a way that people who did not grow up with full comics literacy, uh, you know, giving them the ability to absorb it as immediately as possible. So there, I feel like, it was, it was an unexpected challenge uh, in that, you know, like there are a lot of a lot of moments in book one that involve a lot of internal and emotional landscapes, particularly Congressman Lewis is a young person. And with a lot of those, I was able to kind of fall back on uh, my own, you know, memory of senses and, and my own my own way of seeing my environment growing up as a kid in Alabama. And a lot of that was very intuitive. Um, but then also trying to figure out where the line was between the kind of like weirdo, intuitive comics that I normally write and draw, and then making sure that everything is serving a purpose to convey information or to, uh, you know, to further a sense of humanity to all the characters. But it was just something I'd never, I never directly considered audience in a comic that I've ever done before. And so it was a unique responsibility for this book. I mean, in that sense, considering the audience, was that sort of the big challenge, trying to find the right way to, to present all the information? No, really, it was just, all it took was realizing that that was a consideration. Uh, and it, it didn't really cause too many speed bumps or too much anxiety. A lot, and a lot of it also was, you know, I was born in the late 70s in the South. My parents were baby boomers, and so I grew up with a, you know, a basic, but fairly complete understanding of the civil rights movement in general. And uh, the next hurdle was then realizing that, you know, I'm 35 now, and so there are 25-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 13-year-olds, not to mention who didn't grow up in the South, but uh, that a lot of the basic knowledge that with, with stuff I was taking for granted, uh, that caused a little bit more, you know, pause and consideration than uh, the storytelling issues themselves. Now, um, Congressman, I am curious if any of your colleagues, um, when they're actually, because they, they don't seem to be doing much work, generally, but, <laughs> oh. but given that, have they had the opportunity to read it and talk to you about it? Well, several of um, uh, my colleagues uh, write about uh, the point <laughs> that we're not doing too much work. Uh, that remind me of that when I was growing up, and I think both uh, Andrew and, and Nate have been able to capture this very well. When I was growing up on that farm in rural Alabama, working in the field, uh, I would tell my mother, I said, this is hard work, this is very hard work, and this work is about to kill me. And she said, boy, hard work never kills anybody. I said, well, it's killing me. <laughs> and, uh, so as, as, a, as, as a kid, I would hide under the house, under the porch, and wait for the school bus to come along and uh, run out when I heard the bus coming up the hill with my book bag to get on the bus and go out. And so some of my colleagues asked me about the book. Some of my colleagues are reading the book. And one or two heard a story, I believe, on NPR about the book. And one said to me just this past week, so my wife just wants your book. She heard about it, and I got to get a copy. And so several people have been asking me for a copy, and I've been trying to send a nice way. Uh, you know, you can get it at uh, some stores. <laughs> Just 
you know, when I was 435 members of the house, <laughs> it is my hope that all members of the House and Senate will have an opportunity uh, to read the book um, because I think, especially some of the younger members in the House and some in the Senate, uh, can learn a great deal uh, like young people today uh, and people not so young and learn about it. That period. I mean, Andrew, you, you, we joked around that uh, you caught flat from some of your colleagues for being a comics fan. Well, it's sort of, uh, it's not one of those things that you admit professionally. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it takes a bit of bravery. Uh, but, you know, now it's funny because I guess in some weird way, I found myself being the comic book guy on the hill. <laughs> and uh, so everybody wants to tell me now that they're fans of comics. And um, so, so we've always joked, you know, that there should be like a comic book club. Because everybody's out now, you know, we can be free about it. <laughs> and uh, you'd be surprised. I mean, really, um, like Jake Tapper over at CNN, he came in, we were doing an interview there, and like totally geeked out of the comics when the comic. Um, just all sorts of people, right? So now we're... Now we can be open about this. There's no reason to be ashamed. You know, you take it out front of the rug and, and everything like that. And let your action figures sit on your desk. Uh, right? Don't bend the corners. Um, so you know, it's been, it's actually really fun and liberating to be that guy. You know, like I can just let it fly. It's great. Um, but I think it, it also says something. You know, there's a distance traveled through this project. Um, it was Congress that, in many ways, did in comic books in 1954, um, and then the 50s, and then the subsequent <clears throat> aftermath of the hearings. And in all seriousness, this ruined people's lives. You know, th this was not something that was casual. Congress wields an enormous amount of power with its bully pulpit, and what they did in some respects to me was unforgivable because they saw it as a political opportunity for themselves. I mean, Estes Kofoffer, who was the second chairman of the Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency, um, who held these hearings, they, they, they were, and the first chairman, in fact, I mean, they, they were looking at this as a political advantage at the height of McCarthyism, where everybody was looking for some sort of scourge to blame things on. But really, what you were seeing was the ramifications from, from a world war. Young people were coming to, coming of age seeing uh, they're, they're, the older generation having been mutilated by the bombs and the bullets, um, and then there's more violence in America because you have more people back here, there was, the war effort was over, um, and people needed a scapegoat. They needed someone to blame because they didn't want to take responsibility for themselves and for, for the community that they created. And so uh, Congress used comic books along with some of these family research groups uh, as their scapegoat and ruin the creative lives of individuals who today, I think, you know, we can look back on as, as giving a substantive contribution. Um, and that sucked. <laughs> I mean, that was awful, you know? And, and for us, and I, I mean, I guess I see this from the other side, you know, on the staffer side, where um, we have an opportunity here to do something more than just make a great book, make, tell a great story. Perhaps in some ways we can right a wrong. Um, we can say that it is okay now to be a comic book fan. You don't have to hide. You don't have to be embarrassed. A member of Congress did. <laughs> At least something came out of there. <laughs> well, and. Uh... Well, one of your, your colleagues, uh, Patrick Leahy, actually used the book and held it up. I, I hope he actually bought the copy. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, he, he did say he was going to make the uh, copy available to all of his uh, grandchildren. So uh, we didn't pass any copies on to him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think Andrew is failing to tell a story I, uh, the whole idea of doing this book, and I think that's important. Um, you know, going off to Pamita. Maybe yeah, no one right. tell it, maybe no. I'm just, it uh, <laughs> no, um, 
So it was 2008 on the campaign. Uh, it was my first campaign ever. I was 24 years old. Um, I, I didn't know very much. Um, I, I, I was just figuring out myself. But um, it got to the end of the campaign, and, and we started talking about what we were going to do afterwards. Um, and everybody's like, I'm going to go to the beach. I'm going to go see my mom. I'm going to go see my girlfriend. And I said, I'm going to go to a Comic-Con. <laughs> and everybody looked at me like, okay, so, you're that guy. Um, and I was on a chain. I, I was fine with it, you know, and, and, and the congressman turned around and said, don't laugh. There was a comic book during the movement, and it was incredibly influential. And that sort of, that sort of boggled my mind. It was, it was really one of those moments where lightning strikes, you start thinking, and you're like, you know, you should write. <laughs> because that comic book was called Martin Luther King and the Montgomery Story. It was published December of 1957, but really distributed in 1958. Uh, and, and Martin Luther King actually helped edit it. He offered some small suggestions on the script and things like that that were, um, I, I mean, I think I changed my perspective of Dr. King, right? You know, I mean, he's, he, we see him in this grand, this, this beautiful statue, and, and we see him on, on the, uh, sort of with the halo, right? But I'm just imagining this guy reading a comic book script. You know, uh, was it E.B. Nixon, I think? E.B. Nixon? E. Nixon. E. Nixon. Um, changed the dialogue a little bit, you know, marked through that, right? <laughs> Felt certain tension. Um, and then that comic book goes on to be uh, something that inspires uh, folks in Nashville, uh, there were protests in the Midwest that Lawson, Jim Lawson, who was a field secretary for the Fellowship of Reconciliation, the organization that published the comic book, uh, there were protests out there. Uh, all, all of these, these things started happening in 58 and 59, once the comic book was put out there, right? And uh, by, by, by January of 1960, the comic book had gotten to Greensboro, North Carolina, and into the hands of... Uh, uh, Azel Blair and Joseph McNeil, two of the, what would become known as the Greensboro Four. And when they showed it to each other and they read it and they had that aha moment of, we should have a boycott. We should have a protest. They went and they sat in at the Woolworths lunch counter in Greensboro on February 1st, 1960. And that is the flash point that we look at now as the start of the sit-in movement. Where, from which you saw SNCC emerge and these student leaders emerge uh, that then shaped the politics for the next generation. And for me, being a fan of the X-Men comics and you know, Flash and Mike Beringo's run back then and things like that, it, it seems so amazing to me that it could have that potential, that, that really, that this had happened in our history. And that nobody had told this story, right? Um, it's mentioned briefly in the congressman's book, it's mentioned in a few other places from the Fellowship of Reconciliation, but largely history had ignored this fact until Dalia Zieda goes and dredges up the comic book and publishes it in Arabic and Farsi in 2006-07, then takes it to, to Egypt and distributes it in Tahrir Square in the days and weeks leading up to the revolution in 2011. So here you see nearly 50 years of a comic book inspiring revolution of inspiring, more importantly, nonviolent protests, right? We see violence all over in our communities, on the news. We're contemplating violence in Syria. We're contemplating, we're dealing with the violence that's going on there um, everywhere. And yet, here you had an example of a comic book inspiring a nonviolent protest in places all over the world. In fact, once we got into digging, I did my graduate research on this, if that's why are you a little intense on this? Uh, it showed up, not just there, but it showed up in uh, uh, South Africa, and then it was banned for being incendiary, right? There's no violence in this comic book, but yet they're still banning it down there. There's something about comic books and people liking to ban them. Um, Southern California and, and, and uh, a part of the workers' rights movement. It showed up in Uruguay uh, and used throughout South America. Um, it was incredibly meaningful. So all of that comes together and I just can't stop asking John Lewis to write a comic book. <laughs> and so here we are, five years later. I mean, you want to talk about taking your career and going all in. That's what I did. So I'm really glad it's doing well. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Congressman, 
I did want to ask, because um, this comes up in your book, um, and it comes up in other uh, sources, though it, it's not really part of what we're taught in general. But, well, when you started in the movement, you were very young. Um, David Halberstam's book about the Nashville student movement is called The Children. Um, and you talk in your book about how there was a great deal of tension between you and your, your peers and the older generation of people, uh, people like Thurgood Marshall um, and others who also did not, also believed in nonviolence, but they had a very different approach to it. And I, I wonder if you could just talk a little about what that was and, and what it meant to be young and to think about that. Well, I was very, very young uh, when I first heard of Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. 15 years old in the 10th grade. But growing up there, I, I saw segregation and racial discrimination. I didn't like it. I didn't like the signs that said white waiting, colored waiting, white men, colored men, white women, colored women. I wanted to do something about it, but I didn't know what to do. And I saw what Dr. King was doing was the way, the way out, or maybe the way in. I heard his voice, listened to his words on old radio. I read about him, and in 1957, at the age of 17, I met Rosa Parks. The next year, 1958, I met Martin Luther King Jr. And I wanted to attend a little school called Troy State College, over 10 miles from my home. And applied to go there, but I never heard a word from the school. So I wrote Dr. King the letter. I didn't tell my mother, my father, and my sister, my brother. We bring all this out in, in book one, March book one. And Dr. King invited me to come to Montgomery to meet with him. And on a Saturday morning, my father drove me to the Greyhound bus station. I boarded the bus and traveled to 50 miles from Troy to Montgomery. And he saw a young lawyer. Uh, who had been a lawyer for Rosa Parks and Dr. King, and later became our lawyer during the Freedom Rides and the Morris and Selma to Montgomery, met me and drove me to a church, passed by his colleague, the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, and ushered me into the pastor's study. And I was so scared, I don't know what to say, what to do. When I saw Martin Luther King Jr. and Reverend Ralph Abernathy standing behind the desk, and Dr. King said, are you the boy from Troy? Are you John Lewis? And I said, Dr. King, I'm John Robert Lewis. <laughs> and I gave my whole name. And he started calling me the boy from Troy. <laughs> at that moment, I made a commitment that I would uh, do everything I possibly could in a peaceful, nonviolent fashion to bring down segregation and racial discrimination in the American South. And from time to time, during the sit-ins and, and, and during the Freedom Rides, we would get arrested, we would go to jail. And I remember after returning from being in jail in Mississippi during the summer of 1961, for about 40 days, going to a conference on the campus of Fisher University. And Thurgood Marshall was there. And Mr. Marshall, like President Johnson, was very well known for choosing some very uh, colorful words. <laughs> he called, it, called us everything but a child of God. He said, uh, you, what, whatever, uh, you got to stop doing those uh, sit-ins and freedom rides. Why go and get arrested and go to jail, get your brains knocked out and uh, let us take one case to the Supreme Court. You know, I said, Mr. Marshall, uh, we just can't have a few lawyers involved. We need a mass movement. So that's why we have the city ins That's why we have the Freedom Rides. And we, we had this sense of now. And by 1963, the NACP had a slogan saying, free by 63. And there were young students from Africa attending many of the black colleges and campuses in the South. 
And it was joked with us from time to time. It said the whole of Africa would be free and liberated, and we wouldn't be able to get a hamburger and a Coke at a lunch counter. So we, we didn't like that. So we uh, continued to push and, and pull. And the first time I got arrested and went to jail, and I had been told over and over again by my mother and my father and my grandparents, don't get in trouble. Don't get in trouble. But when I got arrested, I was sitting in an orderly, peaceful, non-violent fashion. I felt like I was getting in trouble. But I called it good trouble and necessary trouble. But I felt free and I felt liberated. I felt like I had crossed over. There was no turning back. When I spoke at the March on Washington on August 28, 1963, 50 years ago, I remember a line in my speech that said, you tell us to wait. You tell us to be patient. We cannot wait. We cannot be patient. We want our freedom and we want it now. And that's what the young people during those days were saying. And it was, it was high school students, not just college students. And in Birmingham, there was elementary school, the middle school student getting arrested and going to jail for what they believed in. Well, and of course, uh, tomorrow marks the 50th anniversary of another uh, major event of that era, uh, the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, uh, where four young girls were killed. I was just in Birmingham uh, Thursday night and all day yesterday and came back to Washington last night. I was there for part of the commemoration effort, and 50 years ago, uh, I traveled from Shore, Alabama, from where I grew up, to Birmingham. We got there a few hours after the church was bombed. And being there with several of my colleagues from the Congress uh, yesterday and participating on the panel, uh, I just kept saying to myself, it's hard and difficult to believe that 50 years ago, or uh, any time, people would be so mean and so vicious or so sick to bomb a church on a Sunday morning, knowing the church is full of people that take the life of four young girls. But back in, during the, during the late 50s and the 60s, it was not only the bombing of churches, but homes, Birmingham, there were so many bombings, they called it Birmingham. But it was churches and it was synagogues that was bombed in parts of the South um, during the late 50s and during the 60s. Now, you mentioned uh, African students who were in the South, and you actually cited uh, in your speech in 63, uh, the, in the march, you talked about the, the slogan that Africans, the African uh, liberation movements used. Well, while I was working on, on that speech for August 28, 1963, had been uh, reading a copy of the New York Times, and I saw a group of black women in Southern Africa carrying signs saying, one man, one vote. So in my March in Washington speech, I said something like, one man, one vote is the African cry. It is ours too, it must be ours. The young people in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee took the position that the only qualification for being able to register to vote should be that of age and residence. But in many parts of the South, people said you had a rule, you had to pass a so-called literacy test. On one occasion, a man in Alabama was asked to count the number of bubbles in a bar soap, or the number of jelly beans in a jar. There were African-American lawyers, doctors, teachers, college professors, were told they could not read or write well enough. So that's why hundreds of students came from all over America in 63, 64, and 65 to work in the South. Uh, in Mississippi, in Alabama, in Georgia, and other parts, to encourage people to pass their so-called literacy tests uh, so they could attempt to register to vote. But the literacy test on poll taxes was, was a device to make it hard and difficult for people to register to vote. If I can put a little context on that, they, it, after the speech of the March on Washington, Jeff Magazine um, called John Lewis the young militant for taking such a position. That says something about the distance traveled. 
right? That the, 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 the requirement to have age and, and citizenship as a qualification to vote, right, was such a leap that, that, that he became known as a militant. And so today, when we look at these positions that some people take, and they say, you know, you're so far out there, you're, you, you have to look at the long arc. Look, the, the long arc of history to see where these positions will be 50 years from now. We're always going to be moving forward as a society if everybody keeps working. I just think that's worth noting. <laughs> now, one thing I was wondering, um, I know you spent, you, were, you went to Africa in 64, 65? 64. 64. Um, and you went there for uh, some of the, the independence celebrations. Um, and while you were there, you met Malcolm X. At, uh, during the fall, it was after the Democratic Convention in Atlanta City in 1964, um, Harry Belafonte uh, raised enough money for 10 people from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee to travel to Africa. And um, we made uh, stops in several countries. We ended up in, uh, two of us, in Nairobi, in Kenya. And we were staying at the hotel, the British hotel, well known, the new Stanley Hotel. And Malcolm was staying in the same hotel. He had missed his flight. We were on our way down to Zambia for the independence celebration. And we had an opportunity to spend about two days with him, uh, having a meal, having breakfast, a lunch, a dinner in the, in the same dining room. And he had returned from Athens. And he wanted to become identified with the movement. He kept on saying, I want to come to Slavia to help you all. Uh, I had first met him the night before the march on Washington. He was at the Capitol Hilton Hotel at 16th and K in Washington, where most of us stayed the night before the march. But I didn't have an opportunity to really to just say hello to him. But we had an opportunity to say, well, you should come. You should come. And so during the Selma movement, he came to Selma uh, to meet with Dr. King, to meet the rest of us, and we were all in jail in Selma. And the local official refused to let him come to the jail to visit us. And he came to Selma on February the 14th, 1965, and spoke at a church full of high school students with Mrs. Martin Luther King, Jr. That was, uh, and seven days later, he was assassinated in New York City on February the 21st. Now, Andrew, Nate, do you guys want to talk a little about what goes on in March Book Two? I mean, Nate, I know you're, I don't know what the phrase, neck deep phrase. Well, keep so asking good questions. You're gonna give away the next two books. <laughs> 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 I mean, basically, the, the nuts and bolts of the script for the entire trilogy is done, but once we worked up uh, a complete enough creative rapport with book one, uh, basically, finally, by the end of book one, we knew exactly how we were working best together. So uh, they're working out some, some tweaks and uh, some structural changes with the rest of the trilogy, but I've got book two thumbnailed, penciled, or I'm in the process of penciling it. But uh, it basically run, the, the major topics covered in it are the freedom rides themselves, uh, sort of climaxing with the town of Parchment Farm in Mississippi, uh, then moving uh, towards and including the March on Washington itself, uh, which butts right up against the bombing of 16th Street uh, Baptist Church in Birmingham. Uh, and that sort of uh, is woven into uh, the 2009 narrative arc involving President Obama's uh, first inaugural day, uh, and both with, uh, with speeches that are delivered from 60, 61, 62, 63, and 2009, um, you know, we, we do our best to provide as many interweavings and parallels, um, but yeah, I mean, book two is incredibly dark and brutal. Uh, compared to book one. And so, um, you know, I feel like one of the major, you know, one of the major themes 
uh, or, or overriding questions in book two is uh, you know, being able to simultaneously consider how far we have come as a society between 63 and 2009, and uh, you know, seeing how that's a piece of the puzzle of how far we have to go. So um, it's, it, it is going to be very interesting in terms of like the sheer amount of, relatively speaking, the sheer amount of brutality that's in book two, uh, especially as, as this trilogy continues to have a, you know, a much, much broader audience and potential you know, with, its, with its scope and its scale. Uh, we'll see how it goes down. Uh, but those are the two major points from the movement that are covered in book two. Because in uh, 60, the events of 63, um, and we like to think of the march, but um, everything else, the, the Birmingham. I mean, you Birmingham. can't tell a story without Birmingham. Um, and there's pieces in there, too, that are, um, you know, I think people look at the March on Washington and the abstract, like it's sort of this standalone event. And then only recently, as we talk about it here and, and elsewhere, we started to go back and look at the events that led up to it. And I think people also fail to connect the dots between you know, the campaign in Birmingham um, and then how that led into both John Lewis becoming chairman of SNCC and its timing and correlation with these other events um, and, and then ultimately the March on Washington and how these big six leaders came to be. Um, because each one of them represented their own organization. Right? I mean, you've got CORE, the NAACP, the Urban League, SCLC. Um, everybody's got... Uh, a constituency that they're fighting for and that was playing a unique role. And so part of what we try to do is to give that broader context um, that is sort of a unique opportunity when you put it in the eyes of, of John Lewis. Um, because, you know, I mean, I mean, I look at it this way, is that we see so many, and this is my personal attraction to this, is that we see these stories that are done in lights. And you see it in front of the cameras and the podiums. But when you turn that around, I, I think we only really get a glimpse of it in, in book one, but in book two it's going to get even deeper into the, the personal story of so many of these people and how, you know, like we're saying about putting a new context on, on Dr. King, but putting a context on all these people, who was scared, who kind of talked too much, who, you know, I mean, these personal things that you know when you're in the room with somebody, but then you, you learn the history of it, and the history says, he was a great man, period. Um, these are individuals. And, and for us, looking at our own lives today and, and what we want to do, you know, we look around the room and we're like, okay, these are not, you know, this may not be the person who's ready to lead us or something like that. But we need to, we need to first of all, respect the dignity and worth of every human being and then look at them as these individuals whose characteristics define their, their stock. Um, and then hopefully you'll see that there are these same issues, problems, that these were normal people fighting and struggling uh, to, to, to undergo and, and to live through this, mo this movement and this revolution. And for, for many of us, uh, you know, these were people who were our age now or younger, uh, which to me is like, you know, working on the book every day, that's the thing that sort of gives me pause every couple of days when I'm you know, doing my photo reference or whatever, and you know, getting a likeness, and all of a sudden it'll hit me that I'm drawing a 21-year-old, uh, or I'm drawing a 30-year-old, uh, and that I'm out-aging all of these people. But you know, I, in, in the abstract, you know, like you can be very well versed in history, and that that simple fact, as far as you know, the the youthful energy, uh, the vitality of the movement, that's something that, that always you know, slips by too. I think it's very easy to slip by. Well, I was going to say, I mean, my, my one criticism of, of book one, which is not really a criticism, um, is that it, because it ends, per, it ends at just the right moment, but it represents how a lot of people like to think the civil rights movement was. It, it, it was ugly, it was uncomfortable, but it was not ugly in a way of, bombing a church on a Sunday morning, on beating people in the streets, on sicking dogs on children. Um, well, but that's a give and take, right? So they make this step forward, tactically, right? Looking into the abstract as a tactics, uh, as a tactical movement. You make the, uh, 
the forward movement of attacking the lunch counters. Right? You're going to make one step forward. Then comes in book two, and you'll see this vigorously, the, the counter reaction. You know, um, there's some early scenes in, in book two uh, at Crystal's where this is, this is just months after uh, the book one ends. And um, Bernard. And Young man by the name of Bernard, Bernard. Lafayette. Was a, was a member of the National Student Movement. Um, they're, they're organizing the protest, and then the, the owner of the store actually turns a fumigator on them, locks the doors, and fumigates the restaurant to try and kill these people. And, and that's, that's how you, like, I mean, f as, as a storyteller, it's a way of introducing to you that the violence. To kill this dude. <laughs> right. Uh, and who's with you? Yeah, great, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Uh, Ray, Ray, uh, sorry. Um, the Ray Leonard. Leonard. Um, as a storyteller, it, it introduces the story as the escalating violence. Okay? But on the flip side, um, that was the natural reaction from a society under siege. Their, their, their customs were under siege. Right? Their, their privilege was under siege. And so you then see, as soon as we start the next book, the unbelievable violence that comes in reaction to the small victory. I mean, the ability to eat at a lunch counter, we treat this as like a major victory, but in reality now, we think nothing of it, you know? But it took so much hard work and sacrifice and discipline to get there. And then the counterpoint to that is then, okay, well, we will try and kill you. But again, to, to give an example, the attorney was a highly respected natural attorney named Z. Alexander Luby. He was one of the first uh, African American to be elected to what they call the board or alderman, or maybe a city council. Uh, today, he was one of the most respected uh, citizens of the city of Nashville. But a group of lawyers, African American lawyers, made a decision to defend all of us, 89 of us who have been arrested in jail. Um, but just sitting in at a lunch counter in a orderly, take this, this is the lunch counter. Black and white students are sitting here together. Woolworth store. Some of us are reading a book, a paper. Some of us may be writing a paper. And some of us may be just looking straight ahead, waiting to be served. And someone will come up and spit on you, put a light and cigarette out in your hair and down your back. They'll start pulling you off your lunch counter stool. And the police officers will come in and arrest all of us, 89 of us, will be arrested and taken to jail. And during that time, how we were negotiating the larger community with the merchants, with the business people. And we seized the protest for about three weeks. We all came out of jail. The training home was bombed. This man home, he barely, along with his wife, barely escaped death. And the Nashville community didn't like it. The black citizen, the white citizen didn't like the bombing of this man home. And later that day, we heard about the bombing. The National Student Group met and said we were marched on City Hall. And more than 4,000 students, black and white, walked in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion. We had sent a telegram to the mayor, said meet us at noon. And it was the mayor of the city who met us, steps of City Hall. And one of the young ladies was on the cover of a uh, Nate does a great job, and if you have your book, you can see her right on, on, the, on the cover. And she asked the mayor, said, Mr. Mayor, do you favor desegregation of the lunch counters? And he said, she said, do you think it's right for business people to invite you into a store and then deny your service? Do you favor desegregation of the lunch counter? And the mayor said, young lady, I do favor the integration of the lunch counter. And the next day, the Nashville, Tennessee, had it as the headline. 
and for a few more days we negotiated. And most of the lunch counters in downtown Nashville desegregated. It became the first major city in the South to desegregate this lunch counter. But it took action, it took drama. And Andrew and Nader Wright, when you move on to book two, book three, there'll be a lot of drama. <laughs> a lot of drama. Some of us almost died in that same church where I met Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. <clears throat> If it hadn't been for President Kennedy and Attorney General Robert Kennedy, people tried to bomb the church, tried to burn the church down. More than 1,500 people in the church. They had in support of the Freedom Riders. It was the President of the United States who placed the city of Montgomery under martial law and federalized the Alabama National Guard. Well, Congressman, I think uh, Andrew made the point earlier that comics have always been trouble. <laughs> and you've been getting in trouble all your life. And uh, well, on behalf of, of all of us, thank you for getting into trouble. And on behalf of comics, thank you for joining us and causing some trouble. Shelf booth uh, shortly to do some more signing. Thank you. Thank you.